Hey y'all, how you doing today? It's day. It is a beautiful, snowy day. I love when the snow is pouring because what that means is coming up, we're gonna have more powder. We're gonna have more to do up on the mountain. We're gonna have more outdoor activities to do. Sledding just became better. Skiing, snowboarding, everything just became better. And I love winter sports because I feel like if it's cold, you can put more things on, but when it gets too hot, I can only take so many things off before people are like, oh, you're blinding me. Anyway, sorry about that. We have here the Borrowers Afloat. We're on chapter eight. So if y'all can grab your copy of the book, like, share, and subscribe to the channel, that'll be awesome. Let's go ahead here and get into chapter eight. <clears throat> On the day the human beings moved out, the borrowers kept very quiet, sitting round the door plate table. They listened to the bangings, the bumpings, the runnings up and down stairs with interest and anxiety. They heard voices they had not heard before and sounds that they could not put a name to. They went on keeping quiet, long after the final bang of the front door had echoed into silence. You never know, Hendry whispered to Pod. They might come back for something. But after a while, the emptiness of the house below seemed to steal in upon them, seeping mysteriously through the lath and plaster, and it seemed to Pod a final kind of emptiness. I think it's all right now, he ventured at last. Suppose one of us went down to Reckentire. I'll go, said Hendery, raising to his feet. None of you move till I give the word. I want the air clear for sound. They sat in silence while he was gone. Hummily stared. At their three modest bundles lying by the door, strapped by Pod to his hat pin. Loopy had lent Hummily a little moleskin jacket, for which Loopy had grown too stout. Arietti wore a scarf of Eglantina's. The tall, willowy creature had placed it round her neck, wound it three times about, but had not said a word. Doesn't she ever speak? Homily had asked once. On a day when she and Lupi had been more friendly. Hardly ever, Lupi had admitted, and never smiles. She's been like that for years. Ever since that time, when as a child, she ran away from home. After a while, Hendry returned and confirmed that the coast was clear. But better light your dips. It's later than I thought. One after another, they scrambled down the matchstick ladder, careless now of noise. The wood box had been pulled well back from the hole, and they flowed out into the room. Cathedral high, it seemed to them, vast and still and echoing, but suddenly all their own. They could do anything, go anywhere. The main window was shuttered as Pod had foreseen, but a small cell-like window sunk low and deep in the wall, let in a last pale reflection of the sunset. The younger cousins in Arietti went quite wild, running in and out of the shadows among their chair legs, exploring the cavern below and tabletop, the underside of which cobweb hung, danced in the light of their dips. Discoveries were made and treasures found under rugs, down cracks in the floor, between loose hearthstones, here a pin, there a matchstick, a button, an old collar stud, a blackened farthing, a coral bread, a hook without its eye, and a broken piece of lead from a lead pencil. The dips were set down, and everybody started climbing, except Loopy, who was too stout, and Pod and Homily, who watched silently, standing beside the door. Hendry tried an overcoat on a nail for the sake of what he might find in the pockets, but he had not Pod's gift for climbing fabric, and had to be rescued by one of his sons from where he was hanging. 
perspiring and breathing hard, clinging to the sleeve button. He should have gone up by the front buttonholes, Pod whispered to Homily. You can get your toes in and pull the pocket toward you like a folding in the scarf. You never want to make direct for a pocket. I wish, Homily whispered back, they'd stop this until we're gone. It was a kind of occasion she would have enjoyed in an ordinary way. A glorious bargain hunt, findings, keepings, with no holds barred. But the shadow of their ordeal hung over her and made such antics seem foolish. Now, exclaimed Henry suddenly, straightening her clothes and coming toward them as though he had guessed her thought. We'd better test out this escape route. He called up his two elder sons, and together the three of them, after spitting in their hands, laid hold of the piece of wood that covered the hole in the door. One, two, three, up, intoned Hendry, ending in a grunt. They gave a mighty heave, and the slab of wood pivoted slowly, squeaking on its one nail, revealing the arch below. Pod took his dip and peered through. Grass and stones he saw for a moment, and some kind of shadowy movement before a draft caught the flame and nearly blew it out. He sheltered the flame with his hand and tried again. Quick, Pod, gasped Hendry. This wood's heavy. Pod peered through again. No grass now. No stones. A rippling blackness. The faintest snuffle of breath. And two sudden pinpoints of fire unblinking in the deadly still. Drop the wood, breathed Pod. He spoke without moving his lips. Quick! He added under his breath as Hendry seemed to hesitate. Can't you hear the bell? And he stood there as though frozen, holding his dip steadily before him. Down came the wood with a clap and humbly screamed. You saw it? Said Pod, turning. He set down his dip and whipped a brow on his sleeve. He was breathing rather heavily. Saw it? cried Homley. In another second, it would have been here amongst us. Timus began to cry and Arietti ran to him. It's all right, Timus. It's gone now. It was only an old ferret, an old tame ferret. Come, I'll tell you a story. She took him under a rough wooden desk where she had seen an old account book. Sitting it up on its outer leaves, she made it into a tent. They crept inside, just the two of them, and between the sheltering pages they soon felt very cozy. Whatever was it? cried Lupi, who had missed the whole occurrence. Like she said, a ferret, announced Pod. That boy's ferret, I shouldn't wonder. If so, it'll be round the house for now on, seeking a way to get in. He turned to Homily. There'll be no leaving here tonight. Loopy, standing in the hearth where the ashes were still warm, sat down suddenly on an empty matchbox that gave an ominous crack. Nearly in amongst us, she repeated faintly, closing her eyes against the ghastly vision. A faint cloud of wood ash rose slowly round her, which she fanned away with her hand. Well, Pod, said Henry after a pause, that's that. How do you mean? said Pod. You can't go that way. The ferret'll be around the house for weeks. Yes, said Pod and was silent for a moment. We'll have to think again. He gazed in a worried way at the shuttered window. The smaller one was a wall aperture glazed to give light but without the glass built in. No possibility there. Let's have a look at that wash house, he said. This door, luckily, had been left ajar. And dip in hand, he slid through the crack. Hendry and Homily slid through after him. And after a while, Arietti followed. Filled with curiosity, she longed to see the wash house. As she longed to see every corner of this vast human edifice, now that they had it to themselves. The chimney she saw in the flickering light of the dip stood back to back with one in the living room. 
In it, there stood a dingy cooking stove. Flagstones covered the floor. An old mangled stood in one corner. In the other, a copper for boiling clothes. Against the wall below the window towered a stone sink. The window above the sink was heavily shattered and rather high. The door, which led outside, was bolted in two places and had a zinc panel across the bottom, reinforcing the wood. Nothing doing there, said Hendry. No, agreed Pod. They went back to the living room. Loopy had recovered somewhat and had risen from the matchbox, leaving it slightly askew. She had brushed herself down and was packing up the borrowing's perpetuity to going upstairs. Come along, chicks, she called to her children. It's nearly midnight and we'll have all day tomorrow. When she saw Henry, she said, I thought we might go up now and have a bite for supper. She gave a little laugh. I'm a wee bit tired, with the ferrets and so on and so forth. Henry looked at Pod. What about you? He said, and as Pod hesitated, Henry turned to Loopy. They've had a hard day too, with the ferrets and so on and so forth, and they can't leave here tonight. Oh, said Loopy and stared. She seemed slightly taken aback. What have we got for supper? Hendry asked her. Six boiled chestnuts, she hesitated, and a smoked minnow each for you and the boys. Well, perhaps we could open something, suggested Hendry after a moment. Again, Loopy hesitated, and the pause became too long. What, uh, of course, she began in a flustered voice, but humbly interrupted. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. But we've got three roast chestnuts ourselves, and an egg. An egg? echoed Loopy amazed. What kind of egg? A hen's egg. A hen's egg? echoed Loopy again, as though a hen were a pterodactyl or a fabulous bird like the phoenix. Where did you get it? Oh, said Homily, it's just an egg we had. And we'd like to stay down here a bit put in Pod, if that's all right with you. Quite all right, said Loopy stiffly. She still looked amazed about the egg. Come, Timus. It took some minutes to round them all up. There was a lot of running back for things, chatter at the foot of the ladder, callings and scoldings, gigglings and take cares. One at a time, Loopy kept saying. One at a time, my lambs. But at last they were all up, and their voices became more muffled as they left the echoing landing for the inner rooms beyond. Light running sounds were heard, small rollings, and the faintest of distant squeakings. How like mice we must sound to humans, Arietti realized as she listened from below. But after a while, even these small patterings ceased, and all became quiet and still. Arietti turned and looked at her parents. At last, they were alone. So it looks like they weren't quite able to get out of there this night. So we'll have to see how they're going to get out or how they're going to get around the ferret coming up. That'll be interesting to find out. Stay tuned for Chapter 9, and you all have a wonderful and blessed day.